Winter snow days. Did anyone go anywhere warm or warm, less cold? 
Mexican Pacific. Huh? <laughs> Mexican Pacific. Oh, that sounds so, yes. nice. There you go. But wait, you probably have family there, right? Yeah. We welcome back everyone. And, uh, hope you, uh, hope you so this week we're going to talk a bit more, a bit about a slightly different approach, um, but but a very interesting approach that has actually gotten quite a lot of attention recently, um, and which also has the extra benefit of the, the guys who did it made some nice videos. So we'll watch a couple of those too. Um, but I think it's interesting for for. Um, Trying to understand just a different a different approach to doing decoding that, that may actually may actually it's an interesting question how much it overlaps with with standard approaches. So, um, but just to, to, to recap a little bit, uh, um, so I think you know we're now in the second half of the semester, and uh, it'll be a good time to really start to 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 dig in a bit more in the class project, which I've also partly been a, a roadblock for. But I think I've, is there anybody who I have not yet replied to their class project email? I think I've actually replied to everyone now. I think. Okay. If I haven't, then let me know. I think I have. Okay. Good. So, in almost all cases, basically my suggestion is, and this is this is not in any way a criticism because this is just a general statement about you know how how you, you know, one comes up with ideas for 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 projects or for proposed studies or uh, in general, is that it's very difficult at first to kind of think, well, you know, what do people know and what do people don't not know? And uh, you know, we discussed this a little bit last time, but now I think it's really the time to actually uh, to actually dig into that. So this is actually going to be your next homework. Uh, I mean, I sent these this 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 list of questions out in an email just a few minutes ago, but. But uh, the next one is basically, um, you know, really kind of get an initial picture of, of of what's known about this particular topic that you're interested in and what the open questions are, and that's kind of actually a hard thing to do. It um, it's easy to say but hard to do. And this is true. This is this is worth doing whether your proposed project is to you know write a kind of grant proposal esque. Uh, idea for an fMRI study, or whether you want to do a specific analysis of of some data. Um, either way, you know, if you even if you're just doing analysis of data, you're doing analysis for a reason. You're doing it to figure out, well, you know, what can we figure out? What can we learn about the brain that we didn't already know? And why would that be an interesting question to ask? So, so this is these are general general problems uh, that that face anybody trying to do this kind of thing even if you've been doing research for a long time. And review articles are really a great resource uh, because otherwise you can do a search and you'll get 100 hits and each, pit, each hit is 20 pages long and you'll be like, oh, I can never read this. Um, but if you, if you hunt around enough, you'll probably be able to find a recent review article, ideally even a, an article from somewhere like Trends of Cognitive Sciences, which might only be six, seven pages long and which will be a really nice place just to start. Definitely not the end of the story, but a place to start, and it can it can help you to find your feet a bit. So, uh, so for your for your homework, the the, the project, you know, find a recent review article on this topic. Find papers that cite it, and really try to identify an open question that hasn't been looked at yet. And in fact, uh, these you know some of these review articles are really good because they even help to point you in that direction. Now, there's no reason whatsoever why you should actually just swallow whole what the authors of that particular review happen to think of the interesting open questions, because it's very likely, and in fact would be more interesting if you think there are some other interesting open questions, or related questions, or some twist on their questions. And, uh, but, that, but that will at least help to kind of narrow the search space a bit, because it can be, it can be a confusing feeling. But if it's not a confusing feeling at all, then you're maybe not kind of hunting enough, because you know, the, you're trying to really kind of push a little bit at the boundary of what people currently know. And 
that, that's going to feel a little bit a little bit confusing and uncomfortable just because you're kind of you know groping around in a dark room. Uh, and uh, this I also put in the email. We talked about it a bit last time, but. The idea is not just to find an open question, but to try and find a question that's actually interesting and worth asking. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the case of imaging, I would say that you know that, that you've, you've got to get more from looking inside the head than you get from outside the head. Otherwise, what's the point of looking inside the head? And you know, more that's actually informative about mechanisms and representations. So not just some pretty pictures. So, so I would say you know a key criterion for is this an interesting question? I mean, this is my personal take on what's an interesting question, but I think many other people in the field would agree, is that we're kind of past the point now where it's just enough just to say, you know, I want to see which areas are active for some particular task. That might be the first step, but the real question is, what can that tell you about how the brain is functioning, how this might relate to behavior? So, uh, so this was also a comment that I put for a couple of people's things, um, you know, really, Looking for activation, looking for regions are involved is, is, is one step along the road, but there's further steps to go. And, uh, and, and the, trying to tie, if, you don't, if you're not sure of, what, of where to go beyond that, trying to tie things to behavior is almost always a good step. Almost anything that's, uh, that's of real interest in, in what the brain is doing is, is going to be interesting because somehow eventually it manifests itself in how we deal with the world, how we behave. So if you can try and find some link, or suggest, or in this case, suggest an experiment that finds some link, or do an analysis that finds some link between uh, the neural activation and particular behaviors that people are doing, then that's, that's really going to be uh, a, a good a good link, a good kind of direction to pursue if you're kind of a bit puzzled about, well, you know, how can I go beyond just seeing which areas light up? So anyway, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the homework for this week, um, kind of try and do these next steps in the, um, in the class project. And, you know, I kind of tailored some of this to the, in, in the emails I sent you, but in general, the next steps are find you know, find what people currently know, find what some open, you know, one or two open questions are, and try and push them in a, suggest directions for pushing them in a way that um, goes beyond just seeing which areas light up, maybe links to behavior, or maybe gets at some representations and mechanisms. Okay, so to talk about getting to representations and mechanisms, there's a very interesting uh, body of work recently that's come from uh, Jack Galant's group. He's a, a visual neuroscientist at, at Berkeley, and um, ben, ben Hayden used to work yep. with Jack Glenn, right? In his past good. life, his past life before he was doing all this, you know, wonderful reward and um, uh, and um, control work, uh, Ben Hayden worked with Jack Glenn, and uh, he's done a lot of work on trying to analyze the structure of how visual cortex represents the world, originally looking at different types of responses of individual cells in neurophysiology, but now uh, branching out a lot into fMRI. And in fact, actually, one of the questions that uh, a couple of you uh, have raised is, especially in your project, you know, how can we form bridges between the um, monkey neurophysiology work and human fMRI. And I think that the Jack Lamb's work is a particularly nice example of that because um, you know he's done both and, and his work very explicitly uh, bridges between the kind of approach, the kind of ways in which people look at um, look at receptive fields in uh, of individual neurons in visual cortex and how you might look at receptive fields of voxels in the brain. So I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about what is a receptive field and how might you look at one, which will be old news to some of you, but will be probably new to some others of you. Um, but, but another question that had, that had come up quite a lot is the, a lot of the decoding studies that we've looked at are looking just at discrete separate items. So for instance, you know, you've got 
the neural response to this stimulus or to that stimulus. Here's the neural response to a chair. Here's the neural response to a bottle. Show someone some neural activation and try and decode, was it a chair or was it a bottle? Well, that's fine. I mean, the world does have discrete, separate objects in it. Things like categorical perception are involved in uh, trying to kind of carve up a, the world into discrete and separate objects or different categories. But, uh, but you know, the world is also very continuous. There's, there's a lot of different things out in the world. that we Just because we happen to learn about stimulus A or B doesn't mean that the next stimulus we're going to see is either going to be A or either going to be B. It might be some different stimulus. We talked about this a little bit too. So what do you do when you're confronted by something new? Well, if it's complete, which happens to us all the time. Well, if you're confronted by something completely new, so new that you just have no idea what to do with it, you're stuck. And that happens to us quite often too. But in general, if we're lucky, we can actually relate this new thing that it's a, to stuff that we already know. Essentially by saying, here's this new object, what do I already know that it's similar to? And insofar as it's similar to things that I already know, I'm going to respond to it or deal with it in a similar way. So you try and f so what you what you're doing there is you're trying to fit this new, newly encountered thing into this world of stuff that you already know. So you're trying to in effect interpolate, meaning literally just kind of put stuff between the things that you already know. And, uh, and if, in order to do that, you have to have, at least implicitly and preferably explicitly, if you really want to understand what's going on, some kind of model of how do all of these separate discrete objects that I know, how do they all kind of fit into, how do they fit together? How do they fit into this big continuous world of ours? And then if you do have some model of how they fit together, then you can start saying, okay, well, here's how something might be kind of, you know, between those or this a little bit similar, if C is a little bit more similar to A than it is to B, then I'm, how am I going to respond to C? And so, just in the, well, the last like five, six years, there's been models in, uh, in fMRI that try and do this. And, um, and this, I think, is a very uh, fruitful and, and interesting set of approaches. So this is a nice diagram uh, from a review paper by uh, Kriegerskorte, uh, which I think kind of nicely illustrates this. So, so here's, uh, here's a kind of cartoon model of, uh, of a stimulus space. Now, in this case, you know, it's, it's color, it's different shapes of slightly different outline forms and different colors. But this is really meant to represent more generally the set of you know, discrete separate items in the world which we've encountered, but which actually have some set of relations to each other which if we can get a handle on that, then we can model and sort of fill in the gaps. So, so here, you know, you've got like a bunch of blue things and then a bunch of kind of blue-greenish things and then a bunch of green things. And then here, they're kind of pointy squares and here they're sort of rounded edge squares and here they're circles. So there's a sort of continuity of mapping of, of, of shape and color across this space. Now, these might actually be visual objects, or they might be things like words. In fact, in the subsequent uh, class, we're going to talk about a model of uh, the continuous structure that might under underlie the semantic space of words. This uh, work was done by Tom Mitchell. Um, so, so, remember how we divide everything up? If we really think that we understand the the underlying regularities in space, then we should be able to divide that space up into training stimuli and testing stimuli. And there ought to be some commonality that we can find between the training and the testing, such that what you've learned on the training stimuli will apply to the testing stimuli too. If you've just been caught up with some happenstance or some noise or some arbitrary and unimportant features of the training stimuli, then they're not going to capture this underlying regularity and they'll do very badly on the testing. So here, so here this little kind of thing, and you probably can't see this text here, but this little kind of red outlined thing is, is a test stimulus, which basically says, okay, there's a bunch of stimuli in this space here and you think that you've got some kind of model of how they're related to each other. Well, if you really do have a model of how they're related to each other, then it should work well, not just for these things that I've already 
told you about, namely this kind of nine set of shapes here, but for something new. And that's like the real test. Okay, if you're really doing something right, I should be able to give you something new, and you should be able to relate it to stuff you already know, and you should be able to respond to it appropriately. So, so, this, is, um, so this is a kind of illustration of uh, the, the actual structure of the stimulus space, how we might model it. We've got to have, if we're going to capture some continuity, we have to have some kind of model. Now, there could be different forms that that model might have, and we're going to show you some examples in just a minute. But, uh, but it's got to have something that basically you know, captures the set of relations between these, these items. And, um, and the hypothesis is that maybe the brain does something like this too. Right? So there's stuff in the world that has some structure to it. There's some model we have of that stuff. And that model captures some of that structure, if it's a, if it's a good model. It's probably not going to capture it perfectly, because you know models never do. Uh, so in this case, that's kind of what's illustrated by this sort of distortion here. So you know the true structure of the space is this kind of you know two-dimensional grid. Our model of it kind of sort of captures some of that, but imperfectly. You know the the, the green things are still down here, the bluish green things are still here, the the pure blue things are still up there, and there's a kind of continuity and shape roundness too. It's gone a little bit distorted, but if things are close by to each other in the actual stimulus space, they're close by to each other here too. So this is a you know, distorted but continuous mapping. And we've learned our mapping on the, the training data, which is like this kind of regular grid of nine things. But we can apply that mapping to the whole space. In fact, this is actually sort of uh, analogous to Remember, we did a, a uh, for those of you who are registered, we did a computer practical of um, spatially normalizing data. And what you do in that is you actually take, take the kind of average bold image and figure out how to, well, the, computer, the algorithms figure it out, how to kind of squish and smoosh and scale that onto a standard template. And then having done that, they then take that, that transformation and apply it to all of your bold images, which might be you know, a couple of hundred images. Well, that's kind of a little bit like what's happening here, sort of. You, you've, you've, got, you've got some transformation that you figure out, OK, here's a set of stimuli. How am I going to transform them in my model? But once you have that, you can apply the transformation to everything. Now, it probably may not work for everything. In fact, it almost certainly won't work for everything. But hopefully, it will at least work for the things which are in the, within this part of the space that you've successfully modeled. So that's why this is kind of shown us between these current existing stimuli. So you're interpolating. You're not extrapolating. I mean, you can try to extrapolate, but you're going to do probably not as well. You know, do, If we have a model of, of this part of the stimulus space here, that doesn't really tell us too much about what's going on over here or what's going on over here. But hopefully, it should tell us something about what's going on within that space. So that's what our model's doing. This is all a bit abstract at the moment, but we're going to make this quite concrete in a minute. Um, well, maybe the brain's doing something similar. Certainly, the brain does seem to respond with some degree of continuity in many cases. So if things are kind of, if things are kind of similar out there in the world by some measure, you have to apply some measure, but, but you know, if they're similar in this case in color or if they're similar in form, then generally speaking, the brain will respond in similar ways too. So there's some continuity in the mapping. So, um, so literally, when you look at you know, this little blue square here, and when you look at this little kind of blue-green square here, and when you look at this green square here, your brain's response to this blue square is more similar to, um, to your brain's response to this bluish green square than it is to your response to this more green square. So there's a con and people actually show this. So, so there's a continuity in your brain's response to these that sort of matches the continuity in the world. Now, we did mention before uh, there's, that's not always the case. So for instance, there's categorical perception, which is basically your brain explicitly breaking the continuity of the world and saying, yeah, I, I don't care about the fact that there's some underlying smoothness. I actually want to say, is it this or is it this? A little bit, which is actually very similar to what a, a classifier does when it categorizes, where it says, first of all, you take a bunch, bunch of inputs, 
and you apply some kind of weighting to them in a linear classifier. You apply some kind of weighting to them and you get some weighted sum. And then you just say, well, is that weighted sum? Often it's great, is, is the question is, is it greater than less than zero? If it's greater than zero, I'm going to say it's class A. If it's less than zero, I'm going to say it's class B. So the sums, there comes a point at which you actually don't want this kind of smooth, continuous, graded, um, weighted sum input value anymore. You want to say, ah, is it this or is it that? You know, should I, should I eat this or should I not eat it? You know, is this thing going to, should I run away from this animal or should I not run away from it? Right? You have to make a kind of decision point. So, uh, so this, this kind of continuous mapping doesn't reflect that, but that's an interesting question of how, how you might modify it to do that. So, um, so if our model is actually capturing something about the stimulus structure, the structure of stimulus space, and if the brain is also capturing something about the structure of stimulus space, then hopefully our model might be doing something a little bit like what the brain's doing. So that's what this, this kind of bidirectional arrow here says, matching representational similarity structure. So you, you, your training set is the stuff that you've, you've learned. The model says, here's how you can kind of fill in the gaps between the stuff that you've learned. And the testing says, OK, well, let's try a new stimulus. Let's try and put something in one of those gaps. Let's see what our model says. And let's see whether that relates to what the brain does. So if our training says, OK, here's how you deal with green roundish squares, and here's how you deal with turquoise roundish squares. And then someone gives me a greenish turquoise extra round square. Then I say, well, I haven't seen one like, like that before, but I'm going to just treat, I'm going to deal with it, you know, kind of 50% like this roundish turquoise square, 50, you know, 25% like that, 25% like a turquoise circle, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so this is the basic idea of, of interpolating, building a model of the stimulus space and interpolating between them. And this hadn't really been done until around 2008. And then two, two papers did it pretty much at once, which both came out in, uh, in Science or Nature, and was deservedly so, very important papers. One is uh, this work that we're going to look at in a minute uh, from Jack Galant's lab, and he's done a lot of follow-ups on that. Another is uh, in the domain of language, which we're going to look at in uh, subsequent weeks uh, from Tom Mitchell's lab. So this approach, the Jack Lant approach, is trying to build a model of the receptive fields of individual voxels. And we're going to, I'm going to try and explain how that relates to this kind of continuity in space. But first of all, I've got to say a little bit, well, what's meant by a receptive field? Now, I know that some of you have uh, more of a neuroscience background, and others of you don't. So just out of interest, and, and there's no shame in not having a <coughs> Who, who, who has already encountered this concept of the receptive field of a neuron, such that you kind of feel that you know what it is? OK, so many, but not all people. OK, which is totally fine, because you know, outside of the domain of you know, cellular neurophysiology, people don't really talk about receptive fields much, I don't think. Uh, but they're an interesting, um, they're, they're a useful way of thinking about um, not just the response of individual neurons, but even the response of, of brain areas. And that's kind of what this Galant work shows. So, so we looked a little bit already at um, maps in visual cortex uh, uh, with reference to that uh, Kamatani and Tong paper. So, so in, in the visual domain, at least, Receptive fields sit in maps. So a receptive field is the part of visual space which, for, say, you're a, say you're a visual neuron sitting in V1. Receptive field is the part of visual space that you respond to. And they're, all, they're always with respect to, just because of the way the brain and retina is wired up, they're always with respect to um, your uh, fixation point, your phobia. Which, uh, which moves around. So as you move around your eyes, your receptive fields, in terms of which part of the world they're taking, and move around too, because they're, they're fixed onto a particular part of the retina. So different parts of, so here's your, your phobia, your fixation point. So if you're looking right here at the center of this crossed uh, kind of bullseye target, then these different quadrants and kind of rings of your visual field get mapped onto different parts of your brain. So you know they get mapped onto the opposite.
hemisphere and up goes down and stuff like that. So this is a kind of visual mapping of how these get represented. So say you're a say you're a neuron, you know, right here sitting in quadrant uh, two here. The neuroreceptive field is to some part of visual space just here. Okay, and similarly, you know, if you're a little bit more in the periphery, say you're a neuron in you know section nine or something here, then your receptive field is over here with respect to where you're fixating right now. Now that's one aspect of a receptive field, that's the spatial location of a receptive field. But um, neurons don't just care about particular spatial location, they're also tuned to particular features. And so we looked at this also in terms of, uh, with reference to the Kamatani and Tong study. So in particular, neurons have partic preferred, visual neurons have preferred, low-level visual cortex neurons have preferred orientations. So, um, so here's another illustration from many of you. You probably, a lot of you probably have seen or have a copy of this Kandel, Schwartz and Jessel textbook. It's kind of like one of like the very well-known textbooks. And Kandel, of course, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Uh, so this is, you know, it, it's a, it's a good textbook. It has some nice, uh, nice clear figures in it. So here's a figure from that. So, so okay. So the, the receptive field. First of all, you figure out which part of visual space am I talking about here. So is it you know, in the left hemifield, is it in the right hemifield? And then you say, what is the preferred feature? So this is going to be very old news to some of you, but not to everyone. So, um, so we already talked about how particular stimuli in primary visual cortex like to have bars or lines or gratings of particular orientation. So this is, a, this is an image of um, kind of spike output from a particular neuron as you put bars of different orientations in its receptive field, and its preferred stimulus is one that's around 45 degrees, and that will make the, the cell fire a lot. So, so those are two dimensions here. You've got space, whereabouts with respect to the foveoid. You've got orientation. And then there's actually another one. Well, there's actually quite a few dimensions, but another one that gets explicit, that's very important and then gets explicitly modeled in these uh, Galan papers is um, uh, spatial frequency. So you're probably all familiar with the concept of frequency in terms of frequency and time. Uh, you know, just does something happen once every second or twice every second or 440 times a second if it's you know the vibration of the tuning fork. Uh, but things can also change in a in a rhythmic way over space as well. And in fact, this is very important for vision. And this is actually also very important for how um, how MRI works. I think that in I think that in the first so so Jan Wee is going to give another physics lecture later in the semester. We haven't fixed the date of that yet. But I I think in his first one, I don't think he talked much about um, uh, kind of taking in different spatial frequencies. Uh, that's actually a very, very important part of how, of how MRI works as well. So, so you have some, say, say you have a neuron that likes things that are at 45 degrees. Okay? Well, if you're just using you know, a line, then any line that's kind of passing back and forth through that neuron, neuron's receptive field at around 45 degrees is going to make the neuron fire. But a line a line actually, it doesn't seem like a line is lots of things at the same time, but a line is kind of lots of things at the same time. A line has this kind of, you know, like a bar with sharp edges. It has uh, some things that are happening very fast, fast in terms of how quickly they change as you move across space. So if you hit the, the edge of a bar, bang, suddenly you've gone from black to white. Suddenly things have changed like that. Right? But then you're still in the bar has some finite width. So you're still in the bar for a bit. So then slowly, 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 things are not changing very much. And then suddenly, bang, they change again when you leave the other side of the bar. So although a bar just seems like an object, from a certain point of view, a bar is actually lots of different processes all happening at the same time. Some are very high spatial frequency, meaning things that change very rapidly across space. And some are very low spatial frequency, things that just kind of slowly, slowly vary. And so that's what's captured by these, uh, these are called Gabor patches. And uh, if you have like a whole bunch of different ones of different orientations, 
of different spatial frequencies. They're often called the Gabor Jet or Gabor Pyramid. People use these in computer vision all the time. I know a couple of you do that, uh, do computer vision type stuff. So <clears throat> if, you have, if you have a neuron that, um, that likes not only things that are at 45 degrees, but also things that are at 45 degrees that tend to have very sharp edges to them, that tend to kind of change quickly over space, then that would be a receptive field that's sensitive to small spatial frequencies like this. I don't know, can you guys see these at the back of the room? So, so this is kind of, you know, quite bunched up lines. And this is literally just made by taking a, a spatial sine wave that goes up and down quite quickly and um, multiplying, convolving it, just sticking a Gaussian mask on it, so basically blurring out the edges. Uh, and then if you take something that changes more slowly, then you get something like this, and then you can get something that changes very slowly. And here I'm talking, when we, we used to think you have change over time, but in spatial frequencies, change over space. Then you have uh, sensitivity to, to large spatial frequencies here. So there's this kind of third dimension that people don't tend to, that is maybe a little bit less intuitive than space and orientation, but also kind of how, um, What's the spatial frequency that you're tuned to? And you, you, you really think of spatial frequency as kind of how blurry is something. Uh, so, you know, if you, if, you, if you kind of scrunch up your eyes and blur everything, or if you're like me and you're short sighted and you take off your glasses, suddenly all you've got is the low spatial frequencies. Um, and if you, um, you know, you've probably seen, you know, like in um, iChat or something like that, or probably in Instagram too, there's a filter that will just give the edges of stuff. Uh, to generally speaking, what an edge filter is doing is it's basically just giving you the high spatial frequencies. I mean, there's a bit more to it than that, but, but it's giving you the stuff where uh, things change a lot. Okay, so this is, um, this is the way in which you can characterize uh, the receptive field of a visual neuron. And in fact, you can actually use you know, the, the Galant Lab's uh, insight was to say, well, hey, let's characterize the receptive fields of voxels using the same trick. And we'll, we'll see in a minute how this lets you uh, get a kind of continuous interpolation through the space of different images, just like we kind of saw in that more abstract diagram. Um, but this is all still kind of a little bit abstract. So let, let's get a, a, a more concrete example. But just before we go, is this, is this concept of spatial frequency clear? Because it, it is not. It's kind of quite different. Well, it's sort of the same, but also different from the way frequency is usually used. Um, and if you really want to understand how MRI works, that spatial frequency is absolutely, absolutely essential. It turns out this is, I mean, John, we will explain this much better than I ever could, but uh, it turns out that the way MRI images are made is that they literally read spatial frequency straight out of the image. They don't detect you know, edges or borders or anything like that. They just read out spatial frequencies. But if you read out enough spatial frequencies, you can get the whole image. Have you, have you guys heard of, uh, probably many of you, but not all of you perhaps have heard of Fourier transform, which is, um, Fourier transform is taking a signal, in this case an image, and kind of splitting it up into a whole range of different frequencies. Okay, so let's get, um, let's get a more concrete example. So, so forget for a minute, uh, you know, having this whole Gabor pyramid of lots of different orientations and spatial frequencies and positions. Let's just look at um, three, three possible channels, if you like. So you can think of each of these orientations and each of these spatial frequencies, spatial frequencies you can think of as a different channel. Well, here's a simpler one. Instead of having lots and lots and lots of channels, you just have three. So as I'm sure you'll know, in the retina, we've got um, uh, cones, we've got two types of cells, rods and cones, and cones are the ones that are more sensitive to color, and in particular, they tend to be tuned to being sensitive to three different colors. So you've got some that are more tuned to, uh, to red, some that are more tuned to green, some that are more tuned to blue. Although, as you can see, this is actually a plot, this is just from Wikipedia, but this is just a plot, this is a plot, actually, of um, uh, the tuning of, uh, of the different cone types. And actually, the red and green ones are surprisingly similar to each other, but uh, the blue one's quite, quite different. And you can see also that these are fairly broad tuning curves. So in fact, even the red, the red ones actually do respond to bluish light. They just don't respond as much. So, so suppose, 
suppose we're, you know, our eye is faced by the, this problem. It says, okay, you know, I've got this much signal coming in from my blue cones, this much coming in from my red cones, this much coming in from my green cones. What color am I seeing? Well, you say, well, that's not that difficult. I can just kind of, you know, use this as a kind of model and say, okay, if I have, you know, signal strength of 0.5 coming from the blue cones and, you know, 0.2 coming from the red and 0.2 coming from the green, then I'm probably seeing something pretty blue. Or, you know, if I, so, and in fact, you know, if, it does, if you ever play in um, things like Photoshop or iPhoto, you probably have actually messed with uh, actually tuning the RG and B values of particular parts of an image or pixels. How many of you actually have done that? Uh, and so you can, for instance, uh, you know, often on the, on the computer, the sli slider will be between 0 and 255. And uh, there's also, if, 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 and if you're into kind of like printing things out, you may have also transformed stuff between the RGB color space and the uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow, and black color space. Have any of you done that? Anyway, so there's different, you've got this three, you've got this three, you've got these three dimensions coming in, and if you know how much blue you've got, how much red you've got, how much green you've got, then you can say, haha, this was my color. Well, this is basically a receptive field model. Right? It, it, it seems kind of too simple to actually be you know, related to this more complicated stuff that we're talking about. But this really is a receptive field model in, in the following sense that the blue cones, their receptive field is not in space. In this case, their receptive field is you know, in color wavelengths. Right? So their preferred stimulus is they like blue stuff, unsurprisingly. The green things like green stuff, although these actually are partial to quite a broad range of stuff, and the red things like red stuff. So if you say, okay, given that I know um, what each of these different three channels like, and given that I know how much they're firing, I can figure out what the color is. So, so people actually took this idea and they said, okay, well, what if you don't know what the, um, what the, the tuning of your particular channels are? Right? Suppose I said to you, okay, you've got three things in your eye and they're responsive to some stuff along the color spectrum but your job is to figure out what that is and then after you figure out what that is then you can use that information to try and figure out what color you're looking at you might say well okay well how am i going to figure that out well i can you know you, you have the advantage in this case that you can actually decide what inputs you're going to show to your eye so you can say okay well i don't really know what they're tuned to but i can you know, show some really bluish light, and I can see, ah, well, it looks like channel number one, which unbeknownst to me is actually the blue channel. That seems to be really active. So I'm going to say, okay, I guess that's, that's the blue channel. But then if you change the wavelength a little bit, well, it's still somewhat active, but not as much. So you could actually, just by changing the input that you give to the system, you could sort of map out what the, what the tuning is of these different channels. That's actually literally how these graphs were made. And then once you've figured out those, uh, those tunings, then you can say, okay, now I can use that information to figure out what color somebody is looking at. So this is a kind of simpler sort of receptive field model. So this is actually what was done in a, in a nice paper um, from David Heger's group at NYU, uh, decoding and reconstructing color from responses in uh, human visual cortex. So, so before, you know, in the previous one, we were just looking at uh, cones, and so there's three of them, there's three channels. But they said, well, let's, you know, there's no reason why visual cortex has to be necessarily tuned to strike the same way as cones. Let's, for good measure, let's throw in, let's see, I think they had six channels. So let's say, so you remember how each of these, each of these tuning functions basically just looks kind of pretty much like a Gaussian, right? It has a peak and it kind of drops off. So they said, Okay, let's imagine that for each given voxel, uh, it has some tendency to respond to colors that you know peak here, some tendency to respond to colors that peak here, some tendency. So it has these six different channels, which are, we're going to assign different weights to. And we can say, okay, if, if I show really blue light and this voxel you know, lights up a lot to that, then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to assign a, a big weight to the blue channel and less to the other channels. 
So, so in just the same way as you would map out the sensitivity of different uh, uh, cones in the retina, you can say for each given voxel in visual cortex, they're looking at um, uh, kind of color sensitive areas of visual cortex, obviously. Uh, for each di different uh, region of visual cortex, I'm going to assign some weight to each of these possible color channels. And then, and then after having figured that out, then I'm going to say, aha, armed with that knowledge. So that's like your training set, in effect. Armed with that knowledge, now I can say, now I can do the testing. And I can say, okay, some, some color is shining on the, the subject's eyes, but, we, but we're going to pretend that we don't know what it is, and we're going to see if we can figure out what it is just by looking at the activation across a whole bunch of voxels. So if, you know, if the color that you're showing is a kind of, I don't know, intense violet or something, then the voxels that, would, that you're previously estimated as being quite tuned to blue are going to be quite active. The ones that were quite tuned to, to say, yellowish green are going to be a lot less active. So you can reconstruct the, uh, the, the color that you think someone is looking at based on the responses of all these different voxels where you basically figured out a color receptive field free voxel. And what this figure shows is that it actually kind of worked quite well. So, uh, so um, this kind of, you can kind of draw the colors on a circle if you want because it's sort of a continuous um, spectrum. And uh, so the actual, the little dot off to the side here is what the color actually was. And the colors around the circle here are the, the um, the responses of the, the tuned voxels, and if you if you sort of take the average of these responses to tuned voxels, it ends up giving something very close to what the color actually was. And note, I don't know if you can see, probably can't see this from that, but this here says novel simile. Okay, so this is testing on colors that were not the colors that were actually presented when they were trying to assign weights to all these channels in the beginning. So we're interpolating. Uh, we've got this kind of model, continuous model of color space. In this case, it's just a circle. This is the, you know, the spectrum that we all know. Um, and we're interpolating between stuff that we were trained on and stuff that we were testing on by using what's in this case a very simple model, which is literally just the colors you know, sit, on a, sit on this one-dimensional ring that there's a, there's a spectrum. Yeah. Just some technical questions. Yeah. Assuming the display is a monitor, how large is it and how far away is it from there? Oh, that's a good question. I'd have to, you know, you'd have to look. I mean, on. not specifically for this, but I mean, typically for fMRI experience. Oh, I things. see. Um, well, the way in which you display, so this is a very good question because um, you might think, well, how on earth can you just, you know, you can't stick a monitor inside a, a